Well, welcome everyone to the first session in the Biointerfaces International 2018. I remember in 2016 getting a ribbing from uh, David Granger. So I would like to return the favor, but I won't do so with so much uh, vigor. Uh, David holds uh, professorial positions in bioengineering, chemistry, pharmaceutical chemistry, as well as orthopedics. Uh, he has in research interests in innovative materials, particularly medical devices, drug delivery, and one of his passions, which is surgical infection. He's also worked on host guest uh, interactions with the uh, development of coatings, no, no, it's as well as analytical methods and uh, molecular methods to characterize surfaces and interfaces. He has extensive industrial experience, particularly in R&D for medical devices, and there, as an industrial uh, scientist, we really appreciated him as being an advocate of uh, common sense as opposed to blindly uh, following regulatory okay. protocols. Um, this has often served to discourage industry uh, to, in developing uh, device-based solutions in healthcare. Uh, David is going to provide a critical <laughs> overview of biointerfacial challenges and unmet need. Dave, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alvin. That was a great introduction, very complimentary. <laughs> I didn't expect that. My job this morning is to, what I say, stir the pot. And so I'm going to try to encourage you to think that you all have job security because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And uh, despite the very brilliant people in this room and working around the world on your problems, uh, that, in fact, there's many things that remain unsolved. So. I've deliberately put together a talk today that will try to outline some of the challenges and perhaps stimulate you to think, and that's my job here. So let's just start right off. Despite the fact that we have notable successes in diagnostics, in drug delivery systems, in medical devices, there's still many, many things that are left unsolved. And we've got uh, the problem with vascular devices that all clot blood, and I'll, I'll discuss this in some detail, uh, that we've got uh, problems with implanted valves and blood pumps, they all calcify. It's an interfacial problem that percutaneous leads in the body that come out through the skin. They all fibrose, sometimes they don't infect, and that's primarily because they don't heal well. That all implanted sensors like glucose sensors and blood pressure sensors, in fact, they also encapsulate and fibrose and fail. Most soft tissue implants fibrose and infect, and I could also argue that hard tissue implants also fibrose. Contact lenses, they irritate and ultimately they infect. If you have a 30-day lens, anybody wearing a 30-day contact lens? No? Anybody wearing? Oh, one person. So I'll, usually I get a bunch. So let me ask you, have you ever worn it more than 30 days? Oh, of course. Many people wear it more than 30 days. The original device approval for that was for 90 days, right? And our FDA in my country said, no, we're not going to allow 90 days, so they roped it back to 30. So in fact, you're, you're justified in wearing it more than 30 days. But there are reasons that you don't wear it, these contact lenses, for more than 30 days, and because the infection risk climbs exponentially beyond that time frame. The original device approval was sought at 90 days. All right, anyway, implant-centered infection, beyond the contact lens to all device categories. Anything that's implanted is infected, uh, infection risk the rest of your life. Many metallic implants, despite how sophisticated metals chemistry and metallurgy are, in fact, we still have major problems with corrosion and ions leaching in the body. Protein fouling is still uncontrolled. It's uncontrolled on ships in the Navy, it's uncontrolled on medical devices. It's uncontrolled on diagnostic surfaces. Haven't solved that problem either. Targeted drug delivery really isn't targeting, and I'll try to show you that. And then creating engineered tissues has proven far more difficult than we anticipated. The number of tissue engineered products on the market in humans, how many people would guess? Anybody want to guess how many in tissue engineered products are on the market? V very few, primarily skin, and there's some cartilage, cartilage products that claim to be engineered, but in fact they're autographed. So uh, material science alone hasn't solved many of these problems, and the question is, can, can clever bioengineering help us deal with that? And I think this is your venue. This is your ability to contribute. 
and to make good where my community has not been able to make an impact. So fasten your seatbelts, and let's take a ride and look at some of these issues in the remaining time I have. All right, so it starts fairly simple. As material scientists, we create some materials, and we then interrogate the surfaces, and we're very good at surface analysis. Surface analysis can tell us composition, and it can tell us structure, and it can tell us about energy gradients, and it also can tell us about mechanical gradients. And those gradients exist in the perpendicular to the surface, and we can create materials in which those gradients exist in the parallel to the surface. So our gradient idea comes from the idea that we understand bulk chemistry and we understand that the surfaces of materials are distinct. And sometimes we can control that surface chemistry and other times we cannot. Uh, if we now extend that surface to simple protein solutions, dogma, dogma would tell us that the chemistry we thought could control proteins at interfaces, but in fact, it's a much more complex problem than that. The Vroman effect tells us that we have this dynamic exchange process, that we have a desorption and adsorption events occurring. How many proteins are there in blood? How many different proteins are there in blood? Anyone want to guess that? Uh, I'm getting answers from the front row. Sally, you're, you're an instructor. You're not part of this workshop. <laughs> I want to ask the students, how many, how many proteins are there in blood? If we count them by the proteome, 100, 200, a million? So it's like two types of, there's two, two, two answers, right? One's wrong and one's right, and nobody cares, right? So somebody give me a number. 10,000. So by the proteome count, it's about 2,200, but we have various isoforms, and we have various different types of metabolic and other types of genetic splice variants and so forth. So that, that's a reasonable number, 2,200 genetic components with variants. So any of those pro protein components can, can absorb to the surface, and we have then this competitive exchange. We have then uh, different types of exchange environments, and we have what's called the Vroman effect. The Vroman effect has been around since Leo Vroman coined this in the 1960s, and this idea that, in fact, at any point of time and space, that proteins can exchange with each other, and the most rapidly absorbed proteins on a surface in the body will be exchanged over time to produce a new equilibrium. So we have a time and space variant with proteins at surfaces that we have not solved with our chemistry. And then we can take it a step further because those proteins then control cells on these surfaces. They control how cells engage with surface chemistry and they also control how cells engage with each other when the cells attach that surface chemistry. And so because we can't really control the proteins on a surface from serum or from plasma or from cell culture media, we also have a difficult time then understanding how we can control cells for cell line dependent surface act interactions like stem cells. We also have a hard time understanding how to do co-culture because having two cells on a surface engaged with an uncontrolled protein environment is, is a very difficult problem. So the ability to move from controlling stem cells and multi-cell cultures is where we need to go in terms of understanding how to produce regenerative medicine. And so regenerative medicine is now stuck in this impasse of trying to understand where do materials contribute to the generation of new tissues when, in fact, we can't control these types of molecular engagements on materials. So here's a work from Joyce Wong's group in Boston University, where they published this idea of looking at a fibronectin-coated surface and a laminin-coated surface, and they put then cell, muscle cells in the cultures, and they looked at different types of surface mechanics. And I bring this in because the next session with Molly and Dave Mooney will talk about then surface mechanics. And what was interesting is that they saw that fibronectin did not allow, uh, 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 sorry, fibronectin and laminin had very distinct behaviors in terms of allowing muscle cell motility. That is, muscle cell motility worked in this surface uh, mechanical gradient for a fibronectin-coated surface, but in fact, with laminin, these cellular movements and these excursions were highly limited. So the idea is that, in fact, it's not just surface mechanics, but it's how proteins engage with that surface mechanic and how cells then respond to how the proteins have engaged with the surface mechanical properties. 
So all of a sudden this becomes a hierarchy with our gradient surfaces of surface chemistry and surface structure and now surface mechanics and how proteins and cells engage with them is in fact not a simple story. And this is just a binary experiment with two proteins, but you can imagine what this might be if you had 2,000 proteins that absorb on a biomaterial in your human body. All right, and it gets even more complicated because we have cell co-cultures now necessary to understand how to produce a tissue like liver, which has four basic cell types, all of which have to coexist and get along with each other. Hepatocytes, a major class of liver cells, can't grow by themselves. They can only grow with an endothelial seeding layer. So how do we get cell cultures to grow? And how do we get co-cultures to grow? when we have monocultures that can grow fine, but in fact, we have to understand how to control the seeding ratio because some cells grow faster than others. Some cells outcompete others. Some cells require certain media that are exclusive and don't allow other cells to grow. So these co-culture conditions are also not so simple. And can we produce co-cultures in which the cellular engagement with each other is physiologically relevant? So this requires an important step called validation and validating then what a co-culture means and what a co-culture has to do in uh, producing regenerative tissue or tissue-like materials is, I think, an unknown question. So we also think that when we miniaturize these systems by putting them into microfluidic systems to create organ on chips, we think this is really clever, but in fact, it's very challenging. And this has been well di diagnosed in the literature where macroscopic cell cultures have certain advantages Microfluidic cell cultures have certain advantages, and now the challenge is with then the scaling of mic macroscopic cultures to mac microscopic cultures is in fact also poorly understood. So if we move stepwise from primitive systems with single cells and single proteins, and we try now to make it more complex to create multicellular systems with many proteins available, many types of media available, the types of challenges to get regenerative medicine types of scaling in materials is in fact an unsolved paradigm. All right, so as we find it scientifically interesting, these types of pictures that are intriguing, that we could put all types of different tissues on a chip, and you can see this popularized literature all over the internet. And in fact, there is a growing interest in human organs on chips, but I would say that it's scientifically interesting, but many claims are unvalidated, and this, though, this is a nice article that was published from a person in industry that says these are nice scientific claims, but in fact, industry needs validation. Industry needs to know where these products actually mimic real tissues, where these products actually mimic real organs, and where they actually perform as the pharmacology and as the screening systems might want them to be useful for industry. So there's no validation for even a single cell culture for the pharmacological testing of drugs at an FDA standard. At a scientific standard, sure, there's a million publications, but in an F FDA regulatory standard, there is no validation. There's no validation for organ function on chip, and there's no validation for multicellular constructs as demonstrated in these cartoons. So you have to be careful about the seduction of this type of artwork online, because reality is, in fact, much different. And if we look then at real tissues, Real tissues are much more than cultured cells. Real tissues have ultrastructure, as shown in this very elegant slice of a trabecular lattice in the condyle of a bone. Mesostructure in terms of cell-cell contacts, as demonstrated in the context of myofibrils in muscle and their mechanotransduction and how that works with cell-cell contacts. That many systems are innervated and they're vascularized. You don't see any innervation. You see no vascularization on a chip model, and that they renew spontaneously and they function spontaneously. Another very important property of real systems that is rarely duplicated on a chip. All right, so here's then examples of very complex structures that are worthy and highly meritorious of emulation and duplication and biomimicry. The lymph system here, the muscle system here, and the way that nerves generate from central to peripheral nervous systems. But again, they suffer when we put them on chip from the same problems of simplification. They cannot be validated in terms of what they do in the body, and then we explant them and put them on a chip, and what, what do we have? All right, materials can only recapitulate so much with cells. 
In fact, tissue engineering has largely been a clinical failure to date. There's very few products. In fact, the easy ones have been done and commercialized, and even their commercial success is modest. Co-cultures struggle to produce these simple tissue comparisons, and materials contributions to helping tissue engineering, to helping regenerative medicine, in fact, are quite difficult. And so this is one way to then think, rethink this process, is that, well, materials are largely failing, perhaps, in supporting regenerative medicine, so I'm just going to use tissue fragments. I take a liver, I chop the liver into pieces, and I put those slices as homeotropic slices in culture, and I have then a organ slice culture. I can take the organs out of the body and put them in a blender and take all the cells apart, reconstitute the cells, and those expanded cells can be reconstituted to produce then an organ-like structure. Or, as Matthias Luthold will talk about later this week, I can take stem cells and use stem cell-derived cultures to produce organogenesis in a dish. And that is perhaps the cutting edge of where we're going with this. But even so, Matthias focuses on what are the fundamental materials requirements to drive this process. All right, let's focus on a bit different thing. So implants, I said before, we've, we've done a marvelous thing with many, many medical devices. We have uh, physicians able to fix human bodies with many types of parts, many types of materials. 95% of what we do restores function, eliminates pain, provides patient satisfaction. But in the 5% of implanted patients right now, many experience severe adverse events that are either involved with pathogenesis, that is with infection, or with coagulopathies, that is thrombosis and blood adverse events. So let's look at some of those. Pathogen contact with implantable surfaces, putting bacteria on surfaces, is thought to be a fundamental step in how infection propagates on medical devices. And so this is a common model for how we think about this, is that a single bacterium encounters a defect on a surface like a scratch or a certain piece of surface chemistry or some contamination, and the bacteria then will adhere and create what's called a biofilm, the biofilm being the adherent colonized state. But bacterial contamination and adhesion alone are not infection. This is what we use in the lab to duplicate infection, but infection is different. Infection is, in fact, the host response to all of those things. The host must respond to bacteria in the body with an inflammatory response. The host primes its immune cells to get rid of bacteria. So that adhesion and colonization are an in vitro experiment. We often duplicate this in the lab. I see hundreds and hundreds of papers as a journal editor every year focused only on this in vitro step. That's a test tube based concept. But what was more interesting is in infection, and infection can only occur in vivo, because only with the host response can you get an infection. You cannot get an infection in a test tube. So many of these papers focused on adhesion and colonization. They never point to how infection results from that. And as a result, most of these studies are irrelevant. They cannot help fix the infection problem in clinical materials. So this gentleman, Anthony Gristina, in the 70s, coined the race for the surface. That is that for any biomaterial that the ability to withstand or prevent infection depended upon how the human body could cover that surface and heal with normal cells, and by doing that, block the ability of bacteria to find a niche on that surface. And so the race for the surface was coined the ability to create a surface chemistry that attracted human cells and rejected bacteria from that surface. And so there's been many types of surface architectures, and here's one polymer brushes in which then we can put different chain densities on a surface and create a brush. And despite many in vitro results, there are very few in vivo implants that have brush chemistry because of production issues, and there are very few examples of where in vivo brush chemistry has actually prevented or reduced infection incidents on clinical materials. Also, there's commercial entities that are selling not snake oil, but they're selling shark skin. So these are then uh, patterns that emulate the patterns on a national, natural shark skin, 
and the company Sharklet has many claims on their website for how this chemistry works. But in fact, there are no in vivo claims, and there are no in vivo results that show that this type of man nano or micro pattern surface chemistry can reduce infection in vivo, only in vitro results. All right, so I did a study years ago in which we took these uh, polyester implants that were made by a Dutch company who wanted to go to human clinical trials. So these were made under GMP conditions for human clinical trials. And we put them in rabbits under GMP condition. 228 implants in one knee of a rabbit versus just the naked implant in the other knee of the rabbit. And we then looked for infection when we seeded those implants first with knee cells, with chondrocytes, with cartilage cells, and compared them in the other knee to the unseeded cells uh, implants. And what we found was that infection, in the case of no cells, was identical to the infection rate when the cells were seeded. So in a powered study, I remind you, there's 228 implants in rabbits. Very expensive study. I don't think it will ever be duplicated. But the only tissue engineered solution to date of putting cells on the surface preceding these implants to avoid the race for the surface to help propagate natural cell engagement with these chemistries led to no difference in the infection rate. So the only powered study in the literature right now suggests that tissue engineering, that is preceding these implants with cells, doesn't change the infection rate. All right, let's change up again. Let's look at the foreign body response. What's the foreign body response? Well, this is a picture of a polytetrafluoroethylene or Teflon-based device in the peritoneal cavity of a rabbit. And after a few weeks in vivo, this peritoneal device gets completely coated with this very thick fibrous capsule. It's many hundreds of microns thick. It has no blood supply. It's white. You can hold it in your hands and you can stretch it. So this capsule is, in fact, what's part of the called the foreign body response. When we implant a device, the device is coated with proteins, and yet these proteins produce a cellular response, and the cellular response produces exuberant fibrosis. And after the course of several weeks, then we get this fibrotic capsule. So that's part of the foreign body response. The biggest problem with the foreign body response is this avascular wall. It prevents immune system response. It prevents natural PO2 oxygenation and vascular supply. And oftentimes, these then produce sites for infection. All right, and there have been many clever studies by people trying to modify materials chemistry, materials texture, materials porosity, materials structures to try to eliminate the foreign body response. And between these arrows in each side, there's then always this very tangible and noticeable fibrotic response. It seems that we can reduce the fibrotic response, but we can never eliminate it. And so this is another problem in which infection and fibrosis, the kind of fibrosis that then affects, um, sorry, that affects this glucose sensing device and all glucose sensing devices that permeate the skin like this small glucose sensor on Medtronic's commercialized continuous glucose monitor. So this little needle goes into the skin and this type of tr this uh, telemetric transmitter then transmits to the insulin pump and you have essentially a self-regulated system in which the blood glucose reading controls the insulin pump system and Medtronic is the world's leader in doing this right now. The problem is that these sensors are only good for, anybody want to guess? How long are these sensors good for? A week, good, seven days. They sought approval for 21 days and they only got seven days. And why is that? Because the FDA saw data that suggested that these, these sensors were not reliable for patients after seven days. And because each one of these units costs in my country about $100, that means that in fact, every week you're replacing a $100 unit on your abdomen, have to re-pierce your abdomen skin and replace that unit, and it's at enormous personal cost, emotional cost, and financial cost. So we're not able to solve this problem because of the foreign body response. All right, and I remind you then that if we take fluorinated surfaces and we compare them to P polyethylene glycol surfaces, there's a, a classic study that shows that, uh, well, <laughs> in, in my experience, I have to deal with medical doctors, and medical doctors think that Teflon is inert. So when you get a medical doctor that talks to you about Teflon being inert, they think that when you put Teflon in the human body, that it's inert. 
that nothing happens to it. It doesn't have a foreign body response. But we know from experience that, in fact, all Teflon surfaces have substantial foreign body reactions in vivo. And we thought the medical doctors also think that Teflon doesn't absorb proteins because it's inert. But in fact, that's another story because they have very high protein absorption in vivo. And then we can compare this to surfaces that have virtually no protein absorption in vivo, like this one from Tom Horvitz's group at the University of Washington. Very low protein absorption, very low platelet binding, and yet the foreign body reaction on both chemistries is identical. So where is surface chemistry leading us here? Very highly hydrophobic surface with lots of proteins absorbed, and it creates a foreign body capsule. Very hydrophilic surface with no proteins absorbed and no platelets absorbed, and it forms a foreign body capsule. And so our design criteria are somehow very confused about how we get around this problem in the clinic. All right, and so they've, some people have gone to drug delivery, where they put the foreign body in, and they put then poly, poly, uh, degradable polymer microspheres containing various drugs, and some of those drugs are shown here. All of them are known to be antifibrotic drugs, and release those drugs around the implant, and in fact, doesn't change the situation either. So drug delivery is not helping in the foreign body response. Surface chemistry is not helping in the foreign body response. And this is a major problem for many industrial sectors. All right. Thrombosis, procoagulation. Sorry, that, that's my timer there going off. OK, hang on a sec. So thrombosis, we have failed synthetic valves. All blood contacting materials must be accompanied by anticoagulant pharmacologies for the life of the patient. Every single implant we put into blood has to be treated with pharmacology because the implanted materials are procoagulants in blood. So this has been termed the blood biomaterials catastrophe by Buddy Ratner. You can read about that. But in fact, if you could produce a material that doesn't clot blood in vivo under continuous flowing conditions, you would be a huge benefit to many, many patients. I'm going to skip through this. So blood compatibility, importantly, though, doesn't have a standard definition. It depends on where you put the material, and it depends on whether it's on the venous side or the arterial side. So it's important to recognize that for any blood compatibility and performance, it depends on the species, because dog blood is different than mouse blood is different than human blood. It depends on venous flow versus arterial flow and I'll show you this in the next slide. It depends on the shear rate of the blood. It depends on the time of blood exposure, so that percutaneous catheters that you use for a blood draw to give a liter of blood as a donation, those have completely different blood compatibility requirements than a heart valve or a or aortic replacement device that's going to be for the life of the patient. And whole blood assays versus platelet-rich plasma versus platelet uh, a nucleate plasma versus serum, they all have different types of blood compatibility. So these questions are very important to ask when you do this type of testing. Uh, the only point I want to point out here is that red clots, we observe red clots because blood is red, and so when you reserve a red clot on sites, it's usually on the venous side. Arterial clots on materials are white because they don't gather Red blood cells, they only gather platelets. So white clots and red clots are highly diagnostic of what's happening in your material, yet you never see people talk about white clots and red clots except in the clinical literature where it's quite common. Biomaterials, people just say, oh, I see red stuff stuck on my biomaterial. It has to be a clot. And in fact, there's many types of those. So blood compatibility is another unsolved issue that has lots of details. And uh, I don't have time to go through this slide. All right, one last issue is then to talk about metallic corrosion. Now, you would have thought by this time, and in this country with its rich history of metallurgy and fine metal production, that we would have solved this problem with metallic implants. And yet, with all types of materials, whether it's cobalt chrome, stainless steel alloys, cobalt nickel alloys, titanium alloys, there's all these systems have problems with corrosion, and if they have problems with corrosion, then they have problems with ions from that oxidation product being in the tissue bed. And so you can find 
huge, this is a brand new paper on histopathological characterization of corrosion products associated with 285 cases of hip implants. And this is a scientific report so looking on the molecular analysis of chromium and cobalt-related toxicity that was associated with the enormous Johnson & Johnson hip implant lawsuit that is still underway. So this is not a solved problem. The fact that we still have metal problems in tissues is amazing to me and represents an interfacial issue. And then the last topic is drug targeting, and we'll talk about this later this afternoon in some detail with Tanya Weil when she gets here. And so passive and active targeting, what's the difference? Well, this is an antibody with a conjugated drug appended to the FC fragment, FAB fragment, FAB fragment, that has found its target on the surface of a cell. So that is an active targeting motif where active ligand receptor engagement allows this drug to be delivered to its target site. That's active. And we'll talk about passive targeting this afternoon. So active targeting takes place using ligands that have particular affinities for the receptor sites. So antibody is a classic way of doing this, but there are many other clinical motifs like folate, biotin, and cobalamin. Folate, biotin, and cobalamin that are all used because of their vitamins. So all cells have receptors for these small molecule vitamins. And you can take these functional groups that are highlighted here and hook them to drugs and create then these drug conjugates that get your drug to its target site. Now we have about 47 antibody-based chemistries that are in the clinic now as targeted drugs. Do we have any of these? Anybody know? The answer was they failed. They've tried to get to the clinic, and so folate-based targeting recently failed. Biotin and cobalamin are still in preclinical testing. So far, these small molecule ligands have not really made pay dirt. So the problem is, is that there's long-standing challenges here, is that the targeted drug carriers suffer from the similar problems as non-targeted drug carriers. All drugs, as we know, have toxicity risk. And all drugs, as we know, have a dose-related efficacy. And so in the clinical setting, targeted drugs have the same thing. We just made the problem a little bit more complicated by having the targeted feature and the drug now together. We have the same toxicity risks and the same efficacy risks. There are thousands of targeted claims in mouse studies and cell cultures. But in fact, few of these have ever, few of these have ever gone to clinical translation. And so one of the reasons is, is that in humans, the percent of the injected dose for targeted antibody drugs that actually goes to tumor sites is, is roughly similar than the non-targeted drugs. And because of the toxicity profile of these systems, when the dose going to the tumor site is almost the same, then the off-site dose, because of the toxicity risks, produces an enhanced problem with these targeted drugs. So we don't get a good bang for the buck in terms of targeting, and we get, in fact, an enhanced toxicity risk profile with these systems. All right, so just one last example here, then. This is a polymer that was actually developed uh, by a faculty member at my institution. It's gone into human clinical trials. It's a soluble polymer with, these, with this uh, targeting unit. It's a sugar that targets receptors in the liver. And this anti-cancer drug shown here with cleavable peptides in which the body's enzymes can cut these systems and free up the targeting agent and free up the, the drug. So this went into human trials. And what's interesting is that it targets the liver. And so here is then the radioactive spect trace and the cross-section of the liver of the human patient showing that where these bright spots are is where the drug went. But the tumor is shown in the middle. So here's the CT scan showing the tumor. And in fact, the drug targets the liver. But in fact, the drug does not target the liver tumor. So this is a big problem. And in fact, we can get the drug to the place, but we can't get the drug to the problem. All right, so I'll leave it here. Anti-active targeting is not convincing. It's a provocative statement. But we'll try to support that this afternoon. And this is another area where, in fact, the myth of the literature of what happens in preclinical models should not cloud the clinical reality. And in fact, very few of these systems ever get into humans 
because they work great in mice and they don't work in humans. So I'm going to skip through here and have talked about animal models. And, and so the challenges we have, again, to go back to the basics, vascular devices, clot blood, I showed you that, implantable sensors, encapsulate and fibrosis, and I showed you why that occurred. Most implanted valves and blood pumps calcify. Calcification is another problem, which I don't have time to talk about, but is a lot of effort that could be exerted there at the interface. We talked about infection. We talked about metallic implants corroding and leaching ions. And we talked about targeted drug delivery. And so all of these things represent this mismatch between what we understand about surface chemistry and materials and what we understand about the host biology. And so I think this workshop is all about those things. And I hope then that you'll dig deeper then as we get into the other experts talking about the other things. You dig deeper and ask them the difficult questions that allow you to make some differences here when we've not been able to really move a lot of these questions forward to the clinic. So thanks, Alvin. Yeah. Firstly, David, thank you. That was fantastic and really dropped the bomb on everything. <laughs> um, so my question is regarding the foreign body response. You contrasted two different studies, mm -hmm. one that showed um, hydrophobic surfaces with protein ab absorption and one that showed hydrophilic surfaces without protein absorption. Um, is the story the same? I, I know it's useful to have a contrast, but is the story the same so far for the other combination, hydrophilic with protein? Uh, yes, as far as I know, n no combinations of surface chemistry have changed anything in the human body. We can see lots of different reactions in a cell culture dish. And I think this is where the kind of red herring begins, is that it's easy to publish a cell culture study, and it's very difficult then to show how that extends to a very complex situation in an animal or in a human being. So I think what we have been able to do is use mutant mouse models that lack certain immune responses or lack certain inflammatory responses or even lack competent fibroblasts to produce fibrosis. And then we stick materials into these mutant animals to see what the mechanism is in terms of producing fibrosis. And we can change the relative thickness of the capsule. But if you change it from 110 microns thick, which is this enormous thing, it's like a plastic bag, right? And then you change it to 25 microns thick, does that really make any difference clinically? your glucose sensor still fails trying to get glucose through a 25 micron capsule to the sensor as it would in a 110 micron capsule. So while we can change the problem's dimensions, we have not eliminated the problem clinically to allow the extension of glucose sensor life or many other sensors that are plagued by the same problem. And fibrosis also is responsible for contractile problems around breast implants and around many other soft tissue implants like hernia meshes and many other things. So it's not just sensors, it's, a, it's an endemic problem with a wide class of implantable materials. Thank you. Frederick Hook. Uh, the, uh, yes, that's me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So when, when you have these mutated animals, does the surface chemistry then play a role? Was that what you said? Or with these mutations, you, you change the behavior? Is it all related to biology? Or does surface chemistry ever start to... Because that would be a way to perhaps look for the reason why surface chemistry doesn't matter for, for implants. Well, I think it's even more complex than that. You know, Lars Bjørsten in your com country, I, I've not met him for many years now, but he was pioneering in the 70s of producing these different silastic implants where now bulk mechanics were put into the peritoneum of rabbits and mice and shown to produce very different capsules depending on the bulk mechanics of the material. Then Jim Browker came along and he then popularized and invented the company Dexcom, which is a very competitive company in the glucose sensor field. And he showed that porosity, materials porosity, was very key in producing a extension or a delay of the fibrotic response so that you could in fact take a sensor that would fibrose in three days on a solid material and now by producing certain texturing and porosity you could take that out to 21 days and that's the basis for the technology at Dexcom and their competitive glucose sensor. 
So I think it's much more complicated than even just talking about surface chemistry because then topography and microtopology and how cells and the fibrotic response res respond to that uh, uh, are yeah, related in some fantastic multi-parametric way that nobody's been able to te tease out so far. I have some questions here online. So one question is, how do you think high-throughput material synthesis methodologies can solve some of the problems you presented? Yeah, so I, I just for full disclosure, so I'm an advisor to the Nottingham Institute that, in fact, its entire mission is, is high-throughput combinatorial chemistry for looking at different biomaterials for specific problems under Morgan Alexander and Cameron Alexander. So those people are, in fact, convinced that, in fact, high-throughput chemistries can find materials without a hypothesis, right? We're just, we're searching a material space, we're testing them rapidly, and we're screening using select parameters for those parameters that matter in application X or those that matter in application Y. So there's not really a hypothesis-driven approach, it's completely empirically driven. And so the danger of that is, how do you get a PhD student yeah. to get a, a PhD thesis if there's you know, no hypothesis? So that's one issue, uh, I think that the drug the drug screening community went down this road 20 years ago and decided that, yeah, it produced a million, million candidates, but they didn't have time really to validate and screen them effectively. So combinatorial chemistry and materials um, has been around, and the question is what, what, will, what will happen? I, I, think that, I think that there are certainly advantages to doing so. Um, how academics will deal with those advantages in a PhD-driven process will be, I think, challenging. So we got... I saw, sorry, I saw David's hand up first. Go ahead. But is it related to this issue? Because her, her comment is. Go ahead. Okay, Sally, go ahead. I was just going to say, when, when you were doing that type of material screening, when you're pointing out that the assays don't work, how do you validate your material at that point if the assay that you're using then doesn't translate anyway? Well, that's, I think, a challenge of that particular center and a continual critique of that center is that they, pick, they picked arbitrary landmarks for benchmarking materials performance in blood coagulation and complement activation and in fibrosis and drug delivery. And so if those markers and those assays are wrong, then their fishing expedition is going off in the wrong direction. So I, I think that you have to validate your assays first. And under an FDA process, you would be forced to validate to show that your surrogate markers are, in fact, predictive of the phenomena that you wish to show. Uh, I think this is a work in progress for them. Thank you. So I really enjoyed your lecture, David. So it's always very uh, invigorating. Um, I was wondering, though, if you could put some of your comments in the context of bone implants, where, you know, bone is one area that I think many people think that implants tend not to heal without a foreign body response. You tend to get good integration, and certainly there are issues with certain of them corroding, but there's also many, you know, different types of implants that we place in bone that are very stable, provide very good long-term function. So is there a lesson from bone that we can think about applying to soft tissues, or how do you look at this? Yeah, so I think that of course, I have an opinion, but um, I, I think that part of, the, part of the secret here is that bone produces this rigid interlocking framework, and I think that there are lots of evidence to show at the ultrastructural level that the actual intimate contact between many bone cells and metal isn't necessarily cell direct metal engagement. I know that many companies claim direct cell metal apposition, that's their words, but in fact, if you look at Dave Paleo's work and other people who've done ultrastructural analysis of many explanted materials, that there is a fibrous layer at the you know, nanometer level on the surface of bone in many cases. The only case I would say was maybe not true is titanium. Okay, so that's one issue where direct bone apposition may in fact be fiction in many metal senses. The second one is that because you calcify this new, newly forming matrix, you form this mechanically robust system. So even if the cells do not directly engage with the material, they're mechanically locked so that the newly forming bone produces this stable interface. I would argue that, by contrast, soft tissues have a micro-motion issue where the implant really is never stabilized in that soft tissue environment. It can flow. It's been shown in rats, for example, that they can twitch muscles in their back when we put these dorsal implants in their back, that they twitch these muscles and can actually produce this massaging tendency around implants as an irritation response to the implant that produces this soft tissue 
fibrosis around this. So the idea of mechanically and rigidly locking an implant in place in bone with screws and ultimately with calcified new tissue, I think is a huge advantage for bone. And that's why we don't see a lot of these problems, my, my opinion. Okay, with, with that, I'd like, to, okay, one last question. <laughs> go, go. This is what's left on there. There's one last question. Anything there? No. Just one more. Oh. Um, please, could you give us uh, one example of a successful soft tissue implant and maybe what are the um, parameters that drive the success so that we can learn um, if we want to de develop a material for soft tissue? So what are the key parameters and um, what we can learn from the last uh, few decades? Wow, that's a tough, that is a tough question. I mean... Every, every soft material implant is successful at some degree. We have many hernia meshes. We have tunneled catheters. We have wound coverings. We have artificial skin. We have, I'm trying to think of other things. Uh, we have uh, vascular devices that go into the walls of uh, aneurysms and embolisms and so forth. So there's many examples of these systems. The problem is, is when, the, when they fail, they fail under a certain cost, and they fail under a certain morbidity, and they fail the clinician and they fail the patient. So I think there are many examples of soft tissue implants of, of highly various designs, of highly various biomaterials, uh, uh, many different cons constructions. So I, I don't know how to answer your question. When, the, when these systems fail, the, the idea is how do we analyze that failure? What did fail? And how can we improve the design of the device, the materials of the device, the host response to the device to make sure that it doesn't fail again or it, it improves itself. So I think there are many examples that I could spend hours talking about the successes of our field. And I think when you go to many medical device meetings, that's all people do is talk about the successes. The problem is, is in the failures. And then you have patients and their physicians asking, why is nobody paying attention to you know, the, the failure mechanisms? And I think this is where this group, when I was asked to talk about the challenges, there are no challenges with success. The challenges are in the failures, and that's why I focused on, on those particular problems, because this intelligence, this collective intelligence, collective resource base, and collective um, ability to move in the next 30 years will, will fix some of these problems. Okay, with that, I'd like to close the session. Thanks, Alvin. Thank you, David.